in the name of the father in the name of the father of the son and of the holy spirit amen amen thank you jesus thank you father thank you holy spirit thank you lord for one more day in our life thank you lord for the breath that you have given us thank you lord for making it possible for this opportunity to come in your presence and listen to your word to worship you to praise you to give you all the glory yes lord every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are the lord thank you jesus for our brother winson who is going to give us who is going to break the word to us holy spirit we believe that you have anointed his lips his mind his whole being and as we prepare ourselves to listen to your word we believe holy spirit that each one gathered over here are alert and attentive to the word that you are going to speak through our brother winson thank you jesus for filling us with your love and giving us this time in our lives to listen to your word yes lord thank you jesus for your wonderful presence in our midst because your word says where two or three are gathered in my name i am there in your midst we believe lord that you are Amen. there in our midst Amen. jesus Amen. we praise you and we thank you because you are the one who make us whole lord holy spirit thank you for being our consoler our counselor our friend lord we thank you and we praise you as we receive your word in our hearts let this word penetrate in our hearts and as we move ahead help us that when we face with difficult situations this word will give us life power yes. strength and power us to face the situations of our lives yes thank you jesus for all your goodness that follows us all your faithfulness that follows us because your compassion is new every morning your mercy is new every morning lord jesus yes yes lord jesus. thank you your goodness never fails to follow us lord jesus we praise you we give you the glory lord jesus i make this prayer in jesus mighty and glorious name amen 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 amen, amen. thank you sister wendy for that very spiritual prayer and my brothers and sisters a warm welcome to you all today we are going to study on the day's gospel and we have been on luke chapter 19 today uh, luke chapter 18 today we are going to study on luke chapter 19 and in today's gospel we will see that jesus is already inside of jericho yesterday's gospel passage he was on his way to jericho where he met the blind men and we studied about bartimaeus it was actually two blind men but we studied about that one blind man who actually received this healing and then when he got healed he started following jesus and today's gospel my brothers and sisters in chapter 19 jesus who was on his way to jericho is now already in jericho and he has this encounter with this tax collector by the name of Zacchaeus so today's gospel is from luke chapter 19 verses 1 to 10 luke chapter 19 verses 1 to 10 so let's hear the gospel passage first and then we'll begin to study verse by verse and see what the lord wants to teach us to today's gospel passage So today's gospel passage is from Luke chapter 19 verses 1 to 10. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold there was a man named Zacchaeus who was the chief among the publicans and he was rich and he sought to see Jesus who he was. 
and could not for the press because he was of little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was who passed that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So, my brothers and sisters, as I mentioned to you at the introduction, Jesus was on his way to Jericho, had just healed the blind men. He had now entered into, into, into Jericho. And as he enters in Jericho, he encounters a man by the name of Zacchaeus. I know my brothers and sisters, what is special about, you know, this man Zacchaeus is, this man, nobody would ever even think that Jesus would ever enter his house. He was a sinner. He was the chief of tax collectors. He was a publican. And if you understand the, the culture at that time, People who lived that way were actually isolated from the religious people. And Zacchaeus, if you really, as we read, as we read, in, as we just read in the today's gospel, he was the chief of the tax collectors. He was the chief of the tax collectors, which means tax collectors at that time used to work for the Roman soldier, Roman Empire, they used to work for the Roman emperor. They were the people who used to work against their own countrymen. And therefore, the Jewish people always were against the tax collectors because the tax collectors manipulated the whole situation and they overtaxed their own citizens and they pocketed the money. It's something like this. You know, you, you, you take a particular building on rent, you, you pay an X amount to, to the owner, and then finally, you decide what will be the rent of each flat. And whatever the rent is, is finally going to be your money. And I'm sure my brothers and sisters, anyone who pays their X amount, say pays about, you know, a, a million, or say probably $10,000 in order to rent a whole building. The person who's going to keep people on rent in that building is surely going to go and make more money, probably 15 or 20 or 25 10 he has to pay to the owner as a fixed stem. So anything that he earns about 10 is something that is going to be a profit to him. And you know, my brothers and sisters, this is exactly how these tax collectors work. They had a fixed amount to give to the Roman Empire, to the Roman Emperor for the, for the taxes of the people. And once they had paid that amount, whatever they charged extra from the people is what they pocketed and that is how they became extremely rich. They became extremely rich. And because they actually manipulated their own countrymen, Zacchaeus, who was the chief of the tax collectors, was a person who was hated by his own countrymen. So when we come to this particular gospel today, when we hear the story about Zacchaeus, Jesus has entered into Jericho. And as he enters into Jericho, Let's go to verse number two. Let's see what happens there. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. And he was rich. And he was rich. Zacchaeus was the chief among the publicans. Remember, 
the publicans were sinners they were tax collectors and you know my sister and brothers if you go to the other synoptic gospel whether you go to uh, matthew's gospel you go to mark's gospel you go to john you will find that only luke has written about zacchaeus only luke's gospel talks about what happened this encounter between jesus and zacchaeus and their brothers sisters our knowledge of zacchaeus is extremely limited and the information that we have is only limited to this passage about zacchaeus and you know sister and brother as you read this particular gospel passage you will see that zacchaeus was the chief among the tax collectors he was the chief he was like the big boss and he had a lot of tax collectors under him who used to send around collecting the taxes from the people so it is probable that all the tax collectors in jericho reported or answered directly to zacchaeus and he was possibly like you know sort of the head of the whole region that was there and he was the man who was controlling these taxes which had to be paid to the to the roman empire so this zacchaeus was an extremely rich man that's what the word of god says he was rich he was rich because he had amassed wealth by deceit and by fraudulent means as a tax collector you know if you if you really understand uh, what a tax collector's role was at that time the tax collector's role was simply to be like sort of you know suckers of the citizens of their own country and as a result now they had amassed a lot of wealth and zacchaeus was filthy rich because of the way he had amassed the wealth let's go to verse number 8 and he sought to see jesus who he was and could not for the press because he was little of stature now when you read this english brothers sisters from the king james version he says and he sought to see jesus who he was and could not for the press it's talking about the crowds that were following jesus remember wherever jesus went there were crowds following him thousands of thousands of people wanted to follow were following jesus because jesus wherever he went he performed miracle he performed signs and wonders and because of all these things that were happening in the land of israel a lot of people were actually following him but what was the problem with zacchaeus zacchaeus was was a was little in stature that means he was a short man he was not a tall man he was not a man of normal height he was a short man and you know my brothers sisters if he was a short man surely he had trouble to see jesus if there was such a huge crowd as it is you know he was not popular with the people people would have hated him if there was a stampede they would have first got got hold of zacchaeus and probably tried to do harm to him and this man zacchaeus has a desire to see jesus zacchaeus the tax collector the sinner the one who is fleecing the people has a desire to see jesus you know my brothers and sisters listen to this very carefully you know many people have trouble seeing jesus for various reasons many people you know as long as they have trouble they have some problem in their life they will come but otherwise they do not want to see jesus they don't want to be involved in a relationship with him it could be possibly because you know they be having a job you know they could it could be possibly because of their position maybe it is their status maybe it is their circumstances but whatever be the reason my brothers and sisters most of the people will let their this this particular reasons as i mentioned to you stop them from coming to jesus but zacchaeus zacchaeus was very determined you know my brothers and sisters zacchaeus was so determined that that it got him noticed by jesus you know imagine zacchaeus is is, is a sinner first and foremost the people hate him there is no way that you know he is going to get access to jesus by the normal means and now this man who is hated by the people who in normal circumstances would not even get an opportunity to meet jesus he is determined to see jesus you know sister and brother listen to this very carefully you know our determination is a very big part of our faith you know it's just not it's just not saying that i got faith with me you know i may have faith but if that faith does not let me go into action it's only a passive faith i can say i pray a lot 
I do a lot, but I don't even go into action. There is no way that I'm ever going to have an encounter with Jesus. You know, sister and brothers, if you, if you go to the book of Judges, Judges chapter 6, you know, this is, the, this is the word that I've been sharing with our youth. In fact, today I'll be sharing that, not today, because today I will have got another class. But last week we started with our youth, sharing with them from Judges chapter 6, where God has an encounter with a man called Gideon. And you know, Gideon was a very, you know, he was, he was not a very strong man. He was not a very, you know, illustrious man. But this man was busy doing something. He was actually pressing the corn at the, at the press when the Lord sent his angel to meet this man Gideon and told him, you are a warrior. You are a great man of God. And you know, in the natural, this man Gideon did not really think that he was something special. But because he was out there doing something, that is why the Lord encountered him. You know, the enemies were coming of Israel against the people of Israel. They were destroying their property. They were taking their crops. But this man was at the press doing something and really working hard. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, this man, Zacchaeus, if he did not have determination, it was there was no chance for him to ever have an encounter with Jesus. You must remember that tax collectors were hated by the Jews. And you know, if this man wanted to go and you know uh, see Jesus, what does he do? He goes and climbs up a tree. Let's go and see the next verse. The next verse, that is verse number four, tells us exactly what this man was a short of stature, who was hated by the people, who, who, who really had a desire to see Jesus. What does he do in order to see Jesus? He's not going to meet him. He only wants to see Jesus, who this man is, so that he can have a look with his eyes, who Jesus really looks like. Let's read that. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. Look at what the word of God says. He ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see Jesus, for Jesus was to pass that way. You know, my brothers and sisters, Zacchaeus had a desire to see Jesus, which was more important to him than what people thought about him. You know, yesterday we read about the, the blind man. You know, uh, Bartimaeus was a blind man. And, you know, when he heard Jesus passing by, he was shouting his lungs out because he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And, you know, the people told him, keep quiet. Don't you open your mouth. You're disturbing this crowd. You're making a lot of noise. But, you know, my brothers and sisters, for the blind man, Bartimaeus, what people thought about him was not important to him. This was the miracle of a lifetime. This was the opportunity of a lifetime that he had. And he was not going to miss it. So he kept on yelling out at the top of his voice, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. In the same way, this man Zacchaeus was a tax collector who was hated by the people. For him, what was more important was in order to have a look at Jesus, to have an encounter with Jesus, than what people thought about him because he was a sinner. And you know, my sisters and brothers, that is the key to getting into the presence of God. I, I hope you're understanding. As long as you have a desire to come in the presence of God, you have a desire to have an encounter with the Lord, you desire that, you know, you need the Lord in your life. That particular desire, putting aside everything, not worrying about what people are saying, you know, putting aside some of the things which we have been doing, and coming to the Lord is the key to getting into the presence of the Lord. And what did Zacchaeus do? You know, Zacchaeus' action of climbing up the sycamore tree, it shows us that at least he was curious to know about Jesus. You know, you know, my brothers and sisters, Zacchaeus being a short man, he goes there, he sees the crowd, he knows he cannot have, have a look at Jesus. But he knows that Jesus is going to pass that way. He's, he's heading in a direction. He goes ahead. He climbs up the sycamore tree because as Jesus is going to pass that side, he is going to have a look at Jesus. And you know, my brothers and sisters, this particular action of his was, was what Jesus really admired. You know, what he did that day allowed him 
to have an encounter with Jesus, so much so that Jesus even came into his house. You know, you know, my brothers and sisters, it shows us that, that Zacchaeus was really seeking the Lord. You know, nobody will ever think that Zacchaeus only wanted to see Jesus, that there must have been something in his heart which desired the Lord, what he was doing on the outside, what the people thought about him, what he was doing in reality was wrong. He was doing the wrong thing. He was collecting extra taxes. He had become rich by fleecing the people. But in his heart, there was a desire to know the Lord. You know, my brothers and sisters, there was a desire in Zacchaeus to seek the Lord. And God does not look on the outside. God does not judge us based on what we are doing on the outside. Many a times, we human beings, when we look at somebody, we say, oh, that man is a, is a sinner. He's a drunkard. He's a womanizer. He's this, he's that. Because we go based on our side. But God is always looking at the heart. And you know, my brothers and sisters, God saw the desire in Zacchaeus to seek him. And what does Jesus do? We will see later that Jesus actually told Zacchaeus, come down, he said, Zacchaeus. I must have a meal at your house today. I must eat at your house today. You know, my brothers and sisters, we as human beings, because we live in this world, we are so much inclined to go based on our five senses, based on what we hear someone say, based on how somebody's behavior is, whether somebody talks too much, whether somebody is, you know, yelling, somebody is screaming, somebody is, you know, we are always focused on our external, on our five senses. But God is always looking at the heart. And this man, Zacchaeus, had a heart that was seeking the Lord. Now, what does it say? He went and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see Jesus as he was passing by. Now, brothers and sisters, if you really, if you really study deeply about a sycamore tree, a sycamore tree in the Bible was actually a fig tree. A sycamore tree was actually a fig tree. And, you know, just to give you a little bit of historical background about, about a fig tree or a sycamore tree. You know, they grew in abundance in the, in the land of Judah. Lots of fig trees were planted. And, the, and, you know, the wood of this fig tree or the sycamore tree was used for buildings. Although it was not, you know, as durable as cedar. Cedar was a very durable tree. And, you know, the, the, the fruit of this particular uh, fig tree, it, grew, it, it actually grew in clusters on the tree. And, you know, the trunk was something that was used as wood in order to, to use for, you know, making some things for the house or chairs or table. And, you know, the, the, the sycamore tree or the fig tree, if you really go and see, it grew to a height of about 8 to about 12 to 14 meters. And sometimes it even grew horizontally to even about 20 meters. It was grown on the, on the you know, on the, on the pathways on the roadside because it was aesthetically very good looking. It was a very beautiful tree and it is still a beautiful tree. Fig trees are extremely beautiful looking. Sycamore trees are extremely good looking. And that's why they used to be always planted along the way. And this man, Zacchaeus, goes ahead on one of those trees along the way where Jesus is going to walk. He climbs up that tree and now from that tree, he wants to have a look at Jesus of Nazareth who's going to pass by that side because he, shot. he is a sinner in the eyes of people. He is seeking the Lord and the Lord knows it. The Lord knows it. The people of Israel do not know what Zacchaeus is on the inside. They only know him as a sinner. They know him as a tax collector. They know him as an evil man. They know him as a man who is only meant to go to hell. But here is the Lord who is now going to see and have an encounter with Zacchaeus. Let's go and read verse number five. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Now, you know, my brothers and sisters, if you read verse number five, I don't know whether you have really see, read it and saw, seen something very strange in this verse. Something extremely strange. You know, my brothers and sisters, if, if somebody announces in your, in your church or somebody announces in your, in your neighborhood that they are going to get married, you don't simply say to them, I'm going to come to your wedding. Do you say that? You will not say until they actually give you an invitation. But you know, in verse number five, you find that this is the only instance in the New Testament 
where Jesus invited himself to someone's house. Jesus invited himself to someone's house and to whose house? To a very notorious man and extremely rich. I mean, you know, you know, you know, my brothers and sisters, please, please look at this verse again. When you read this verse, Jesus is with the thousands of people. He's walking into Jericho. He sees this man, Zacchaeus on the tree. And he looks at Zacchaeus on the tree, the man who's wanting to only see him. He looks up to Zacchaeus. He calls him out by name. And he says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to have a meal at your house today. You know, my brothers and sisters, first and foremost, for Jesus to look up and call down Zacchaeus, Jesus doesn't know Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus doesn't know Jesus, but for Jesus to call this man out, it surely must be a divine appointment. It must be surely a divine appointment because Jesus has never met Zacchaeus. He doesn't know that Zacchaeus up the tree. It is only the Holy Spirit who is revealing to Jesus that this man on the tree is Zacchaeus. And he says, Zacchaeus, come down. I must eat at your house today. And you know, my brothers and sisters, now listen, all the trouble begins at this very point. You know, this action of Jesus now is conceived by the crowd as him associating with a sinner and doing it for a hope of getting some gain, getting some money, getting some wealth. You know, you know please understand how the people of Israel thought. Here is a man whom they are not associating with. He's an enemy of the people of Israel. He is an enemy of the, of, the, of the sons of the soil. He is an enemy of the citizens because he is taking money, he is overcharging them. Jesus, instead of going to people who really need and be at their house, he enters into Jericho and he calls this man down, Zacchaeus, who definitely is not popular with the people. And in front of all the thousands of people who are around him, he looks up to him and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. Today, I must eat at your house. And you know, my brothers and sisters, the moment Jesus does that, all the people who are around, of course, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they were after Jesus even for doing good. Can you imagine what would have been their state when they come to know that Jesus is going to eat at Zacchaeus' house? You know, my brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. If this particular thing had to happen to me, you know, this certainly this accusation would certainly be true of today. Certainly it would be true today. But it was, it was, it wasn't that, that it was different then. It wasn't different then. Because you know, my brothers and sisters, people have not changed in their thinking. People do not change in their thinking. Jesus now going into Zacchaeus' house, people start thinking, how come this man goes into Zacchaeus' house? He's probably having a deal with this man. Is he going to get money out of him? This man is extremely wealthy. Now people start murmuring. People start complaining. How come Jesus can go into the house of Zacchaeus? And you know, my brothers and sisters, in spite of all that people are thinking, in spite of all the opinion of the people, in spite of all the evil that they are thinking about Jesus, Jesus readily identifies with a well-known sinner and a rich man. You know, you know my brothers and sisters, when we, when we realize this, you know, many of us today should begin to understand that people's opinion should never matter to us when it comes to coming to Jesus. You know, you know my brothers and sisters, there are so many people today, they will say, yes, I go to church, I come to Bible class, I go to this Bible class, I go to that Bible class, I don't go to this one, I go to that one, and we begin to make some certain judgments in our mind, depending on where we have to go and where we don't have to go. But you know, my brothers and sisters, God knows our heart, whether we are really seeking him, whether we are really seeking the truth. And Jesus, instead of worrying about the opinion of people, worrying about you know, what the, the, the crowds would think about him, which they were thinking anyway negative, when, what the Pharisees would think about him, what the religious leaders uh, would think about him, he readily identifies with this man Zacchaeus, who's not only a rich man, but he's also a terrible sinner. And you know, my sister and brothers, Jesus wasn't going there to get any gain from him. 
Jesus was not going to get any gain from Zacchaeus. It was Zacchaeus who was going to gain when Jesus going to his house. You know, you know, you know my brothers and sisters, I, I hope you are, you are really understanding this. Many a times, we don't want to enter somebody's house. We don't want to go to somebody's place and share the gospel with them because we are afraid that somebody will say, how do you go and associate with those people? How will you go and talk to those people? They are very, very evil people. They are very, very rotten people. They are basically rich people. Maybe, you know, you're going there to get some benefit out of them. But you know, sisters and brothers, if your motive is clear and the spirit of God has led you to any place, the Holy Spirit has the purpose why he has led you to that place. The word of God tells us, even if you go to the deepest darkness, the Lord says, I will be there with my crook and my staff to lead you. And therefore, we should not worry where we are going as long as it is directed by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was not going to Zacchaeus' house to get money. Jesus was not going to Zacchaeus' house to get his riches. Z Jesus was not going to Zacchaeus' house to get his, get his ill-gotten wealth. Jesus was going to Zacchaeus' house for what Zacchaeus was going to gain when he had an encounter with Jesus. You know, my brothers and sisters, Jesus did not discriminate against the rich or the poor. You know, Jesus did not look, ah, you're rich, therefore I will go to you. You're poor, I'm going to go away with you. Jesus never dis discriminated between the rich and the poor. All were poor according to what he was used to doing. You know, my brothers and sisters, please understand, when we are poor in spirit, when we know that we don't have enough of God and the knowledge of God within us, we are all poor people. And you know, Jesus dealt with people according to their hearts. And he saw in Zacchaeus, a man who was seeking him a humble heart. You know, you know, you know, my brothers and sisters, it is very easy for us to put up an image in front of people in the church or in our community or in our in our in our in our in our, in our prayer group or anywhere around. We can always show ourselves as very holy people or put up an image on the outside. But you know, my sister and brothers. We can never fool God. We can never cheat God. He knows us through and through. He knows our hearts. He knows whether we are really seeking him with all our heart. And therefore, brothers and sisters, Jesus called out the man, the name of this man, whom he had never seen before. He goes there on that side. He sees Zacchaeus up the tree and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. And you know, my sister and brother, Jesus said what we also can do the same way. Because he told us in John chapter 14, verse number 12, he says, what if you believe in me, you shall do the same works that I did. You know, you will do the same works that I did. You know, if Jesus could call out Zacchaeus, there are times, brothers and sisters, in the Holy, through, through the gift of knowledge of the Holy Spirit, you know, there are so many things the Holy Spirit reveals. You may not know what is going on in the life of that person, but the moment you open your mouth and is directed by the Holy Spirit, he will reveal to you certain things, which is actually called the gift of knowledge. And therefore, John chapter 14, verse number 12. What does it say? Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my father. So, brothers and sisters, if Jesus could call out Zacchaeus by name, he could tell him, Zacchaeus, come down. Jesus had never had an encounter with Zacchaeus. Then in the same way, we don't need to know the names of people, but the Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the gift of the Holy Spirit, through the gift of knowledge, he will give us certain revelations which will help us in order to minister to people. It will help us to reach out to people. It will help us, you know, to be a blessing to people if we depend on the Holy Spirit and don't depend on our own wisdom and our own understanding. Now let's go back to this verse and see what it says. It says, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him. You know, my brother says, what is the meaning of this word looked up? This word looked up is talking about not the angle of Jesus' head. It's not looking that Jesus looked up and therefore, because he was looking up, it was, he, was, he was able to see Zacchaeus. You know, the Greek word looked up simply means analepo, analepo. Ana, ana plebo, it is actually ana plebo. Ana plebo simply means to see again, to see again, not to see only once, but to see again, to see with the eyes of faith. That's exactly what this word looked up means. And therefore, brothers and sisters, Jesus saw with more than his physical eyes at Zacchaeus. He was seeing 
from his spirit that allowed him to call Zacchaeus by his name, even though Jesus had never met Zacchaeus, even though Zacchaeus had never had an encounter with Jesus. You know, it's the same thing that happened to Nathaniel. If you read in John chapter 3, you know, Nathaniel was actually with Philip. And when Jesus met Nathaniel, he told Philip, I saw you under the fig tree even before Philip came. And you know, my brothers and sisters, this particular knowledge that Jesus had, he was man, he was 100%, and many, many people will say, he was God, therefore he knew everything. It's not true, my brothers and sisters. It was only through the gift of knowledge that Jesus was able to tell Nathaniel everything. In the same way, Jesus, through the gift of knowledge, was able to call out Zacchaeus' name. In the same way, you and I who belong to Jesus, you and I who have received the Holy Spirit, you and I who have received the new birth, we will have revelations. We will know the secrets. We will know so much of information which we will never know with our brains, which we'll never learn by going to university, which we'll never learn by going and doing a lot of research and philosophy and history. But we will receive that through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's the information we will receive only through the Holy Spirit. And that is called as the word of knowledge. And therefore, brothers and sisters, when we understand through the word of knowledge why God gives it to us, he only gives it to us so that we can be a blessing in the lives of others. We can, you know, probably diagnose the problem of the person whom we are going to minister and help that person to be a blessing just the way Jesus enters the house of Zacchaeus to allow Zacchaeus to benefit, allow Zacchaeus to gain from his relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's go to verse number six. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Now the word of God says, as soon as Jesus looks up, not only is he looking up physically, but he looks in the spirit. He calls out Zacchaeus by name. The Lord reveals to him that this is a man who's got a heart seeking him. Zacchaeus immediately comes down the tree. What an honor for Zacchaeus, my brothers and sisters, that Jesus went to his house to dine with him. That's what Jesus says to him. Today, I must come to your house and I must eat a meal with you. Imagine all the people around must be fuming. What is Jesus doing? Is he gone out of his mind today that he's going to sit and eat a meal at the hands of a Zacchaeus who's literally a traitor to us? But you know, my brothers and sisters, for Zacchaeus at that very moment, was a moment of vindication. It was a moment of honor that the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings was going to dine at his house. You know, my brothers, I'm sure, I'm extremely sure that the religious Pharisees who had actually, you know, shunned this particular uh, uh, Zacchaeus, they should shun sinners, they should keep them away. This particular incident now became something as a, as a, as a reason for them to put more fuel into the fire against Jesus. Because they said, if this man is going to eat with tax collectors and sinners, he surely must be out of his mind. He must be really a terrible man to even, even think of listening to him. And you know, my brothers and sisters, this action of Jesus was, was actually, I would say, better than he giving any sermon anywhere. You know, sometimes a, 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 a particular action which we do when we go and reach out to somebody when we are directed by the Holy Spirit is much powerful than the best sermon or the best homely or the best, you know, anointing session that we could ever have. If we really are led by the Holy Spirit, you know, sisters and brothers, when the whole world says that that bad man is bad, that person is very bad, and we basically go with the crowd, but we don't listen to the Holy Spirit, we are simply missing an opportunity to reach out to somebody who's got the right heart condition but because of public opinion we have simply left that person in the corner and we have allowed the holy spirit i mean we have not allowed the lord to use us to reach out to some particular soul you know sister and brothers today i hope you're listening there may be many people in our life many people in our life where we have heard from others that these people are bad like this they are like that because we have not even had an encounter with them just because we have heard from somebody we also become biased towards them. We also develop some, you know, some sort of a hatred to them without really even knowing them. And now when the spirit of God is actually leading us and telling us, go and reach out to such people because of all the stuff, all the kerosene and petrol and all the, you know, masala that we have heard from these people around us, 
we simply disobey the Lord and we don't become a blessing in the lives of people who really, if they're even, they're so bad in society, they are actually a potential candidate to be, uh, you know, uh, people who should be entering the God's kingdom. You know, sisters and brothers, we human beings have got a tendency to judge people based on the outside. We always look at what they have done. We look at their bio data and we say, these are hopeless people. These people are not worth for anything. And therefore, when people begin to talk about them, in, even in the church or begin to talk in community or in society, we simply begin to label such people and as a result, the Lord who knows the hearts of such people, we begin to fail to become a blessing in the lives of them. I hope, brothers and sisters, this particular verse is helping us to understand that God does not look on the outside. He looks at the heart. We shouldn't be listening to what people are talking negative of somebody, but simply give them a chance so that they also have the opportunity to enter into the kingdom of God. Amen? Luke chapter 19, verse number 7. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Absolutely, exactly what, what I've been saying to you earlier. You know, what other kind of people are there, my brothers and sisters? We have all sinned. Every one of us has sinned and come short of the glory of God. So can we, in our, in our own right, have any reason to judge anybody? I mean, you know, probably my level of sin may be a little less compared to somebody else. But with respect to a holy God, we all are disqualified. We have all failed and, and you know, been short of God's glory. And you know, my brothers and sisters, when people make statements like this, it reveals a lot about the way they think about themselves, the way they view themselves. You know, most of the people who begin to criticize others, you know, when you always have a, uh, have, a, have a spirit of criticizing others, always saying, you know, others are bad, they are like this, they are like that. You know, what is that? What, what, what spirit is that? That spirit is a spirit where you begin to think that you are better than them. Yes, maybe you are better than them. But with respect to a holy God, we are all sinners because none of us is able to love the way we are supposed to love. None of us are able to do what God has called us to do. And therefore, brothers and sisters, when we start making judgments, when we start making statements about other people, you know, always condemning them, talking against them, it actually reveals a lot about ourselves as well. You know, if you will notice this verse, they all murmured. Look at what it says. And Zakir, it says, and when they saw it, they all murmured saying, that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. He's gone to be a guest at a house of a man who is a sinner. They began to murmur. You know, my brothers and sisters, it wasn't only the Pharisees and the scribes who were critical of this. Even some pious Jews thought to keep, you know, company with a tax collector was evil. Even some pious Jews thought that for Jesus to keep company with Zacchaeus, who was a sinner, was a tax collector, was a very evil thing to do. So they also began to murmur. We understand that the tax collector, the, the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders who, who always judge people, who never, you know, uh, were, were good shepherds, doing all this thing is perfectly fine. But even pious Jews at that time thought it was evil to keep company with tax collectors and sinners. And therefore, they also began to murmur. And you know, my brother says, if you read Matthew's gospel in Matthew chapter 5, I believe. If we go to Matthew chapter 5, I believe it is verse number 45, 45 or 46. Can we go there, please? Matthew chapter 5, verse number 46. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, you know, the publicans were hated by the fellow Jews. Publicans were hated by their fellow Jews. They, they disliked them. They simply did not love them. What does it say? Verse number 45, 46. For if you love them which love you, what have you? Do not even the publicans the same? Don't the publicans, don't the sinners love other sinners the same? So what is the great deal if you love only the people who love you? That's what Jesus is saying. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, this is also very true, especially, you know, true because religious Jews, they would despise the worst of sinners. They used to, they used to ignore the sinners. And Jewish religious laws prevented even devout Jews from keeping company with publicans and with tax collectors. That's how bad it was. During the time of Jesus, 
tax collectors and sinners were like literally quarantined. They were like people who were, who were the outcast of society. And therefore, brothers and sisters, if Jesus now, the son of God, this great man of God, this prophet, these people who, who has been performing great signs and wonders, if he has called Zacchaeus down the tree and go to his house to eat, then surely something is wrong with this Jesus because he is going now and absolutely doing what these people don't do. To eat with a, with a, with a publican or to eat with a tax collector was absolutely unthinkable for them. They couldn't imagine Jesus going and eating that since the Jews considered this actually you know, partaking in the, in the publican sins. You know, if, if you really understand the Jewish culture, if you eat a meal together, when, when you eat, break bread together, you are partaking in their, in, their, in their sin. You are partaking in their fellowship. So when Jesus goes to, the, to Zacchaeus' house to eat a meal, it only goes to, it sends a signal to, to all these people that Jesus is partaking in the sin of Zacchaeus. You know, my brothers and sisters, that this was why and the people, you know, they reacted so badly. They reacted so adversely to Jesus eating with Zacchaeus. You know, you know, my brothers and sisters, I don't know, I don't know about today. I really have not much of idea. But if you really think that, you know, you are a preacher, or you are a man of God, or, you know, you're somebody preaching the gospel. And all of a sudden, you know, you go to visit somebody's house. And, and you know, people know you in that particular area. You visit that particular house. People are actually going to start thinking, sure, this man has gone to this house. Because he's going to get some money out of them. You know, probably, you know, they are in problem. They're going to give him a lot of money for his ministry. And people are going to start making a lot of comments. People are going to think, start thinking so adversely. But if that man of God has truly been directed by the Holy Spirit, then surely, my brothers and sisters, this man, forget about the public opinion, should still go to that house, should, should go to that family and give them the gospel, irrespective whether they are going to give him the money or whether they are going to give him anything in return. You know, sisters and brothers, Jesus did not eat at Zacchaeus' house to participate in his sin. Sisters, Jesus was not going into his house in order to get his money. Jesus was not going into his house in order to get anything. Jesus was only going to show him God's love and mercy. And you know, my brothers, sisters, they should always be the criteria. They should always be the criteria wherein we can judge, where we should not judge others. We should not, you know, we should always let the Holy Spirit direct us. You know, when we when we judge others based on what people have said, based on what people are saying. We will never be used by the Lord in order to be a blessing to others. You know, you know, my brothers and sisters, it is true. We must not participate in other people's sins. That is for sure. We should not participate. But we can clearly see that, you know, when, 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 we, when we are led by the Holy Spirit, we, have, we are also warned that we should not, you know, deal with, um, with, uh, with unbelievers. We should not, you know, participate with unbelievers. Let me show you a scripture, what St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. In fact, it's a long verse, but if you read from 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14 to chapter 7 verse 1 or 2, it's actually talking to us about all those things where St. Paul is saying that we should not, in fact, fellowship with unbelievers because there is nothing common between believers and unbelievers. Let's read that. Be you not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? What communion has light with darkness? What has a believer have got common with an unbeliever? There's nothing, absolutely nothing. But at the same time, my brothers and sisters, the Lord doesn't want us only to, you know, go and sit in retreat house or, or no, go into monasteries or go in and become, you know, I don't know what they call it, some cloistered people just sit in one room and just go and do their own thing. 
we are called to be bearers of good news we are called to be the salt of the earth we are called to be the light of the world you know my friends is we need to get out there and start sharing the gospel to people most of the time you know the, the religious church will say you know you just sit in your quiet room put the air conditioner on dim the lights and start praying and there will be a lot of souls that will be saved you know my brothers and sisters souls are not saved by sitting into a as cloistered people or sitting in monasteries and sitting in retreat houses people are saved when the gospel is preached to them that's what jesus said he never said that you have to pray for people's conversion he said to go out and preach the gospel and that's why jesus even went into the house of a sinner he went into the house of zacchaeus today my brothers and sisters the world needs laborers to go out and preach the gospel the lord needs you and me to go out and bring people to christ the lord needs people like you and me to go out and show them that god is merciful that he can extend mercy and forgiveness to them but the problem is we are only sitting in our comfortable rooms we are only we are sitting in offices doing administrating jobs we are not going out and preaching the gospel because if we don't have anything to preach what are we going to share my brothers and sisters and that's why jesus says to us we are the salt of the earth we are the light of the earth we need to go out and be bearers of good news you know my brothers and sisters if we can be in control and minister the love of god christ we can minister the love of god then we are right to associate even with sinners please understand you know it doesn't mean that you know you just go to every sinner and everybody's house and have a good food with them because they got a lot of money if you are under the control of the holy spirit you really want to extend the love of god then please associate yourself with sinners also so that you can extend to them the mercy of god the love of god and bring them to christ you know my brothers and sisters when we are being controlled by the ungodliness of sinners we need we need to be aware that we should never let sinful people take control of us people should not take control of us we should be in control by and directed by the holy spirit that even when we go into the deepest darkness the light of the gospel will keep us there to share the good news in the midst of those people who are there and therefore it is very important for us to understand that you know when we go wherever we go whether we are in the deepest darkness when we are among sinners as well that we will not be hardened enough to shut our mouth but we will go there and preach the gospel there will be people who will contradict us there will be people who will separate from us there will be people who will who will spit at us there will be people who will isolate us but as long as we are directed by the holy spirit as long as we go out there and share the good news many people today who are actually sinners according to the world they will be able to come into the kingdom and they will be also able to receive their salvation brothers and sisters if you truly believe that you have been saved if you truly believe that you are having jesus as your lord god and savior if you truly believe that you are a child of the most high god then it is time for you and me to go out even if there are people whom the society has rejected and share the good news to them share to them the mercy of god share to them the gospel of jesus christ share to them the mercy of god so that they also who are who are actually in a hopeless state can come and also enter the kingdom of god amen let's go to verse number 8 and zacchaeus stood and said unto the lord behold lord the half of my goods i give to the poor and if i have taken anything from any man by false accusation i restore him fourfold now you know my brothers and sisters i want you to carefully pay attention to this you know the religious church has been teaching for a very long time a term called restitution it has been talking about a term restitution you have to make good you have to supply back and when you look at this verse you will realize that all those doctrines of restitution are completely sent out of the window they are sent for a toss because here we see that jesus made no demand about zacchaeus giving away all his money to the poor you will see that jesus never ever said to zacchaeus zacchaeus now that i've come to your house you need to take all that ill gotten wealth and you need to give it away you don't hear anything of this sort jesus had said this to the rich man i, I if you remember in in mark chapter 10 you know in mark chapter 10 i believe in somewhere between 15 to 25 there in mark chapter 10 there was a rich man who came to jesus and he said lord 
What must I do to receive eternal life? And Jesus told him, you know, follow the law. Do what the prophets have said. And he says, I did everything. And then Jesus turns to him and he says, you know, my boy, go and sell all you have. Give it to the poor and then come and follow me. And you know what happened? This man, because he was very rich, he simply went away. He, he was in love with his money. But you know, my brothers and sisters, because Zacchaeus had already repented, money was no longer his God. We can see here from his action what Zacchaeus himself did. What did Zacchaeus do? What did Zacchaeus do? Did Jesus tell him, Zacchaeus, go and give your money to the poor? Go and, you know, squander, you know, what whoever you have cheated with it. You know, my brothers and sisters, it was the goodness of Jesus was willing to openly associate it with this man, Zacchaeus, that led Zacchaeus into repentance. You know, you know, my brothers and sisters, when people receive the love of God, they understand the gospel. The gospel is preached correctly, showing that, you know, God doesn't look at our past to give us a future. When the gospel is preached without telling them the fear of restitution, that there is going to be, you know, there is going to be punishment, there is going to be, you know, I don't know what has been told in the religious church. There's going to be a cost to be paid. That you know, whatever you have done, you're going to be you're going to be punished for that. You know, my brothers and sisters, that's not the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus has borne all our sins. He has borne all our punishment once and for all on the cross of Calvary. All we need to do is come to Him, believe the good news, and from that moment onwards, our life will never ever be the same again. Our life will never, ever be the same again. You know, my brothers and sisters, Zacchaeus truly repented, as we can see from his action in this verse. And you know what he did? He restored fourfold to all the people he had stolen, and he gave half his, his wealth to the poor people. You know, you know, my brothers and sisters, if Jesus had to tell him, I'm sure there would have been a doctrine today which said that, you know, the moment you have cheated somebody, you need to give half your money to the poor because that's what Jesus thought. And then they would have said, if you cheated somebody, you need to pay them fourfold because that's exactly what Jesus said in this verse. But you know, my sister and brother, Jesus never said anything of that sort. It seems that Zacchaeus was going actually, you know, above, above the limit. He was offering beyond the requirements of restitution, which was stated in the Mosaic law. According to the Mosaic law, they had to give, you know, certain restitution. But we belong to the new covenant. You know, after such a restitution under the law, you know, you, 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 you can approach the Lord with, you know, with a guilt offering according to the Old Testament and everything will be fine. But you know, my sister and brothers, in the new testament, in the new covenant, even before you committed that sin, whether you stole, whether you did anything wrong, whether you were a womanizer, whether you were a drunkard, whether you were an alcoholic, whether you were a you were the worst sinner. Do you know that even before you and I were born, even before we committed that sin, Jesus already paid for that sin with his own blood on the cross of Calvary. So if you are going to be taught that whatever you did, you have to pay for it, is simply not according to the gospel. And therefore, we must remember there is no more restitution. There is no more paying back. There is no more need to, you know, to go and, you know, try to do something in order to get God to love you. The moment you accept Christ, the moment you repent, what your heart will tell you, you go ahead and do because the love of God will get into your heart and what your heart leads you to do will be fine and acceptable to God. Whether you give one dollar or you give a million dollars, it's not money that is important. It's your heart condition that will finally decide whether you really accepted the love of God and you are really trusting in him. You know, sister and brothers, I hope you are really understanding this. The religious church today has put in a lot of fear. It has put in a lot of guilt into people. Even after the sin has been confessed, even after they have made a repentance, because they know at the back of their mind that they have to pay sometime later after they go from this life, in some place, in some limbo place, you know, people are simply living and trying to save money in their bank so that people who are living will pray for them and then they will get entry into heaven. Please today remember the blood of Jesus has washed us of our past, present, and future sins. There is no more restitution. There is only mercy. There is only love of God. All we need to do is receive the gospel, change our thinking, and start living our life according to the word of God. And we will see the glory of God in our life. 
praise God for Jesus for what he has done for us on the cross of Calvary. Amen. Verse number nine, Luke chapter 19, verse number nine. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. You know, my brothers and sisters, what Zacchaeus did by his words and actions on that particular day was to show that he repented. He repented. And, you know, his need, you know, for, 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 for you know, for being redeemed, he, he really repented of what, whatever he did. And he was accepted by the Lord. Jesus accepted what he did today, that day. You know, as soon as Jesus enters his house, he has to deal with Jesus. All those Pharisees and tax collectors are there. And this man, Zacchaeus, in front of everybody is telling the Lord, Lord, if I cheated anybody, I'm going to pay them four times. And if there are any poor people, half my wealth I'm going to give. Money was no more his God. His God was, was his, money was his God until the time he had an encounter with Jesus. But as soon as he received the love of God, he, God's mercy was extended to him. God forgave him. This man, he gave his heart to Jesus. You know, my brothers and sisters, a man who was a sinner now entered as a saint into the kingdom of God. You know, sisters and brothers, I hope you are understanding what it is. You know, Jesus never ever mentioned to this man about his ill-gotten wealth. Jesus never mentioned about his ill-gotten wealth. All that Jesus did was, he said, today, this day, salvation has come to this house. You know, my brothers and sisters, I hope all of you are listening right now and you can say to yourself, today, salvation has come to my house. Today, salvation has come to my family. If I have been thinking about my past life, if I've been thinking of all the wrong I've done, I've been thinking of all the sin I've done, I've been thinking about all the things I, I should have done and never did it. Let me tell you something. If you are breathing today and you are hearing the good news of Jesus Christ, the Lord is simply saying to you, I don't care what you did yesterday. I don't even care what you did five minutes ago. If you can accept the good news right now, if you can repent of all that you did, my mercy and my forgiveness is all that you need. And now you take my word, renew your mind, accept me as your Lord, God and Savior. And today I'm going to show you my glory in my life. You know, my brothers and sisters, when you look at, you know, uh, Mark chapter 10, the rich young ruler, which I was talking in Mark chapter 10, he failed to do what Zacchaeus did by giving a full surrender of his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when the rich man was told in Mark chapter 10, you know, Jesus told him, sell all your goods and come to me and you will receive life. You will experience that beautiful life. You will come and follow me as my disciple. What did he do? For him, money was his wealth. Money was his important thing. But what did the Lord tell Zacchaeus? God did not tell Zacchaeus anything. God did not have to tell, Jesus did not have to tell Zacchaeus, go and give your money. Zacchaeus himself received the love of God. He understood God's mercy. and now. He fully surrendered his life to the Lord. And you know, my brothers and sisters, as I said to you, Jesus never mentioned to Zacchaeus about his ill-gotten wealth, all the money that he had done. He didn't have to Zacchaeus, uh, tell Zacchaeus anything because Zacchaeus had a repentant heart and, and he voluntarily offered his wealth to the Lord. He voluntarily from his own heart gave everything. And this proves to us, my brothers and sisters, that the Lord is not after our money. The Lord is not interested in our money. Many people today think that money is my security. My bank balance is my security. My big mansion is my security. My car, my, my, my gold, which is in the bank, is my security. All my wealth and all my ancestral wealth and all my property is my security. You know, my brothers and sisters, it proves to us from today's gospel that the Lord is not interested in our money. He is only after our heart. God is only interested in our heart because when he gets our heart, he gets everything about us. You know, sister and brothers, the problem with us today is that most of the time we try to love God in compartments. We put God into compartments, say, okay, morning time is for the Lord. Rest of the time is my time. Let me do my own thing. You know, God, when he gets our heart, our whole life, our, our whole living, our whole thinking will all be directed by the Lord because we are not living our own life. That's what St. Paul says. In Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20. Can we read that, please? 
Galatians chapter 2 verse number 20. You know, you know, we need to we need to pray like just what Saint Paul prays in Galatians chapter 2 verse number 20. He says, it's no longer I who live. It's no longer I who live, but Christ living in me. You know, my sister and brother, I hope let this be our own prayer today. Just like salvation has come to our house, let this also be our prayer today. Let's read that. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If Jesus gave himself for you and me, my brothers and sisters, then what sort of life are we living right now? Are we living for the Lord or are we living for ourselves? You know, we can make our life in compartments, as I said. We can love the Lord in the morning. We can spend a, a half an hour, one hour in prayer. We can go into tongues. We can read the scriptures. We can do some, you know, some Bible devotions and we can do all that. And the rest of the day, we can be totally oblivious to the Lord and his presence within us, directing us. And we can do our own thing. And then we think that we are living for the Lord. No, sister and brothers, it doesn't work that way. The moment we wake up in the morning, right to the time that we go to bed, every moment of our day is a moment of worship. It's a moment of that awareness that God is with us. He's in us. He wants to direct our life. And if we have Christ within us, then the life that we live, like St. Paul, is not the life that I want to live, but the life of Christ in me. I'm living for my God. And if I can live for my God, then surely everything that you know I have also belongs to him. Or we can say like what Jesus said in, in John chapter 10, verse number, uh, John chapter 17, verse number 10. Can we go there, please? John chapter 17, verse number 10. Jesus said, oh, he's talking to his father. He's saying, Father, all I have is yours and all you have is mine. And you know, if that can be our prayer even today, then you know, my brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter what we have because what we have, we only have a steward mentality. We have only the mentality of a steward that nothing belongs to us. We are only caretakers. Let's read that. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. If everything that I have or you have at this moment, if you believe that is not yours but belongs to the Lord, and all that the Lord has is yours, then you know, my brothers and sisters, we will never have that fear or that anxiety or that insecurity. Where will my mon money come from? Where will my needs be met? Because I know my God is my source. And you know, my brothers and sisters, if today, right at this today, right now as we are listening about Zacchaeus, we are reflecting about the rich young man. We are talking about the, the two blind men who forgot about the crowd. They did not worry about the people's opinion. They did not even care about what other people thought about them. I'm sure... Zacchaeus must have lived in his own house. His wife, his children must have been there. They must be saying, what has happened to our father today? He's going to give half the money to the poor. He's going to give four times to those who are cheated. What about us? But you know, my sister and brothers, Jesus said, what love came into Zacchaeus that day of the father? That love was going to bring salvation, not only to Zacchaeus, but to his entire household. His entire household was now confirmed to be in heaven. They were sinners. They were the, that was the family of sinners. That was the house of sinners. But this house of sinners on that particular day was transformed in the house of saints. They were now fit for the kingdom of God. They were now fit to become disciples in the kingdom. And that's exactly what Jesus said. Today, salvation has come to this house. Because this man also is a son of Abraham. You know, my brothers and sisters, today we cannot say we are sons of Abraham. We are sons of the Most High, Most High God, because we have accepted Jesus as our Lord, God, and Savior. When we accept Jesus, you and I become children of our Heavenly Father. And when we become children of the Heavenly Father, there is nothing that the Lord will ever make less in your life. As long as you can trust him, as long as you can believe in him, as long as you can put everything into his hands, knowing that this is a loving God who will never ever leave us or ever forsake us. Amen. Let's go for our final verse for today. Uh, Luke chapter 18, 19, verse number 10. For the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which are lost. You know, my brothers and sisters, I hope what I'm going to say right now may not shock you. 
But do you know that rich people are lost just as much as poor people are lost? You know, people think that only if they are rich, then they are going with the money. Therefore, they are going to be, you know, lost. Only the poor people are going to be saved. But do you know that rich people are lost just as much poor people are lost? You know, let, let me put it this way. You know, a minister who prefers one over the other is nothing but discriminating. If you are a minister of the word, if you are a preacher, you are a pastor, you are really, you know, involved in doing the Lord's work, which we are all called to do, because this work is not only limited to a few people. If you are a believer, you have your marching orders to go to the ends of the earth and preach the gospel. Therefore, if you are a true believer, you cannot prefer the rich people and you cannot discriminate over the poor people. You know, sisters and brothers, preachers and those who are ministering God's word must be aware and watchful in this matter. It is very important because, you know, many of them, when you go together to preach, there are a lot of people who come along with you and say, don't go there, don't deal with this, don't talk to this, don't do this. You know, my brothers and sisters, do not ever discriminate people based on their wealth or none of it. Some people may have wealth, some people may have nothing. If the Holy Spirit directs you, whether it's a poor house or a rich house, please go and share the gospel. The gospel is not to be preached only to a few. The gospel is to be preached to every single person on the face of the earth because the word of God tells us that Jesus, the son of man, he came to, he came to seek and to save that which are lost. So it doesn't matter whether you got money or you don't have money, whether you are rich or whether you are poor. We are all people without Christ, we are lost. And therefore, when the gospel is preached, it's only by receiving the gospel. Whether you have wealth or no wealth, whether you have status or no status, we simply need to go and share the gospel to the ends of the earth and bring people to Christ so that they also can have the opportunity to be saved. Amen? Let us pray. Pastor Justina, let us pray. Uh, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you. We appreciate it, my Father, Lord. My Lord, here we are today. Thank you for receiving a new mind. Thank you for receiving a new word from God, my Father, Lord. Lord, as we receiving this word, let this word be rooted in our heart. Let we share the gospel to poor and rich, my Father, Lord. My Lord, we thank you today. Lord, continue to fill our brother with a new mind, with a new thought. Fill him with a full anointed from you, Lord, as he continue to teach us. We are so blessed to have him, my Lord. It's not because he is a faithful. It's not because he is a, a, a rich, but it's because he obey the Holy Spirit and he obey your word, my Lord. Thank you to have him once again, my Lord. Thank you for all the brothers and the sisters that you are here today. Lord, let the love lead us, my Father. Thank you, Jesus, for the new mind. Thank you for the new vision that we are going to have. Thank you for the new dream that we are going to receive through this teaching for today, my Lord. Thank you for more wisdom that is coming. Thank you for new revelation that we are going to have, my Father. Thank you, Master Jesus. Bless us, bless of everyone in this world. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Pastor amen. Christina. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank, Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Thank Jesus. You, Lord.